what's it going to take? Even with climate-related disasters increasing in frequency and magnitude, Yale's program on climate change communication found this year that only a third of people in the U.S. say they hear about climate change in the media even once a week, and only 36 percent discuss climate change even occasionally. Will bursting into the news with protest action get people's attention? That's what the youth-led climate justice movement's banking on. According to that same survey, people under 35 years old discuss climate change twice as much as their elders. And people even younger than that led this October's international climate strike. Two of our guests today began organizing as teenagers with Extinction Rebellion, a direct action movement which draws on the nonviolent civil disobedience tactics of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the independence movement in India. One starved himself for 10 days in the U.S. Capitol to protest a, quote, criminally complicit government's inaction. Will tactics like these finally get people's attention, get policymakers to act? Here to discuss that are Extinction Rebellion organizers Aisha Siddiqua and Giovanni Tamakas, along with Libro de la Piana, senior organizer at the Alliance for a Just Society, who it turns out is teaching civil disobedience tactics and organizing at the University of Berkeley with Saru Jayaraman. So welcome all of you. Um, let's start with the two of you, Giovanni. How did you come to this movement and how did you end up making the decision to go on hunger strike? Not once, but you're going to do it again, which will be twice. Because we're going to die. That's the bottom line. What we're facing is an absolutely catastrophic existential crisis. The fact of the matter is, is that billions of people are going to die if we do not keep this climate crisis in check. I have family in Southeast Asia who are going to be affected by the failure of rice crops from the melting of the Himalayan glaciers and the rising sea levels that are going to inundate those crops. I have family in El Salvador who may die from the crop failures in that region, in the dry corridor. This is what's coming down the line. And the fact of the matter is, you will never ever bring about fundamental societal change unless you get the eyeballs. And this is what hunger striking and radical actions do. They get the eyeballs of people. Because at that fundamental point, that's the first point at which people begin to change their minds. Alicia, how about you? Um, so I just want to state that XR is nonviolent. We come bearing music and compassion for the planet, but just like Giovanni stated, I as a youth, as an individual who has participated in the youth climate strike mark, uh, am extremely, extremely angry and frustrated. Talk about um, it. Yeah, I agree with Greta when she said, how dare you? How dare we let the people of Sudan starve? How dare we let the people of Yemen starve? Why are people suffering because we continue to exploit their resources? And now the climate crisis is finally knocking on our doors and we are ignoring it. We are putting the lives of our children at risk of the next seven generations. We've already ignored the indigenous people of these lands. Um, it's come to the point where as Martin Luther King Jr. said, if we don't do anything radical or some aggressive as XR is being looked at, no one will listen to mm. us. The, the cup is overflowing. We have to do something now. Gandhi always said it's not aggressive, it's assertive. <laughs> <laughs> um, was there a moment before you got involved? You were, was there a kind of Aisha before and Aisha after, do you remember a, a moment? Because we have a society that tells all of us to learn, listen, be quiet, especially women, especially girls, you know, um, be seen, not heard, uh, learn how to make change, be pragmatic. But you two have not succumbed to that. And I want to know how come, how it happened, and what provoked this fury? 
Um, I think for me personally, it's been sort of brewing for a long period of time. I am a college student, so I sit in classrooms. I have to listen to professors tell me about how to change the world. I mean, I'm taking a lot of public policy classes, and that's not to demean anybody, but it's I cannot learn from these textbooks what I need to do to change the system. Um, sitting in those classrooms. It will not get me anywhere. And unfortunately, that's the reality of the situation. Why are we in these closed buildings being told to study for our futures when we potentially will not have a future? Um, the, the traditional road is not working anymore. It won't guarantee us the nine to five life. And what about you, Giovanni? Was there a pre-Giovanni? Because I've realized that it's over for this civilization. I realized that, well, just a couple days ago, a few days ago, the International Monetary Fund literally said that there is a non-negligible risk of human extinction from climate catastrophe. That means it's a, there is a significant risk for human extinction extinction that is currently present from this crisis. Now you think that would be block capital headlines and maybe we'd all be talking about it. I mean, Libra, I don't mean to be yeah. amused here, but it is extraordinary the contrast between the passion we're hearing from our guests here and the kind of passive ho-hum that seems still to dominate majority culture. I mean, I think the reality is that in many people's lives, they may see no change at all or a very small change. And one of the things that Extinction Rebellion and the, the, the climate strikes and others are trying to do is to bring that crisis, which some people are affected by directly who are at the front lines of this crisis, is to bring it into people's living rooms, is to bring it home, to expose like what's happening maybe in a remote place in the world uh, to folks who are sitting at home and thinking, well, I think it's an issue, but, you know, I have other issues. Mm, so can those tactics work in a mere period where, unlike in the civil rights era or even in the wars of independence in India, we have a media that is just kind of flooding the zone with information. We have an attention span that has shrunk to a peanut and people are suspicious of fake news. You know, I think it's gonna be a lot harder. I mean, it, it's no mystery that TV was the secret weapon of the civil rights movement. The fact that millions of people had TVs in their homes for the first time meant that the Birmingham campaign, watching kids being uh, attacked with dogs and fire hoses, it brought it into people's living rooms. Uh, today, that doesn't cut it, right? There, as you said, there's a million channels, there's a, fire hose of information. And so I think we have to be more creative about not just having dramatic action, but then how do you bring it home? Mm -hmm. How do we take those actions from Wall Street and from uh, uh, you know, Washington and bring it to Main Street? Yeah. You know, how do we uh, really let people know that this crisis can't be ignored? I mean, I mean, not to disparage a hunger strike, which is major, how does it go though from being, I don't want to say symbolic because it's not symbolic, it's real flesh and blood you, not eating. Um, but how do you turn it into policy change, action? What's the plan? Well, what Extinction Rebellion wants is very simple. What we want is a declaration of climate and ecological emergency. What we want is zero carbon by 2025. What we want is a citizen's assembly to oversee a just transition for all human beings. And a just transition, and a just transition means that you prioritize human rights over profit, that you prioritize climate refugees, that you prioritize communities of color and other disaffected communities that are going to be impacted most and first mm. and worse by this climate crisis. So this is really a broad intersectional agenda. Um, do you want to speak to that? And, and, and how do we get it? Okay, so um, we're mentioning wars, we're mentioning news and media. Um, during World War II, the New York Times posted daily headlines telling people even the minute details like what soldiers were doing. Yeah. The war that's heading our way will kill, affect, disproportionately um, cause suffering more than any war that has come to pass. 
um, it will cause hunger, it will cause pain, and the kind of pain will not be able to be medicated with immediate medicine. Right. It's going to be starvation. And so what's heading our way is, if not the biggest issue humanity faces, that's why we have these very specific demands. That's why our, our actions are so dramatic. We, we cannot work against the media or the sources of information that are available to people. We need, we need them as much as they need us. Mm. We need to be working in hand with the quote unquote liberal progressive medias. We're not asking, for example, Fox News to change its agenda. We're asking for the New York Times to put it on its headlines. We're asking for the Washington Post to put it on its headlines. The, the people that claim to be um, for justice, for social movements, it's your time to do it. We're and as we know, it's a media ecosystem in which there is also independent media like ours. Um, I had a dear friend that always said it was the independent media that brings issues to the boil and the mainstream that inhales the steam. Um, so in the spirit of that, here's our report from the um, climate strikes of this October and some of the actions of Extinction Rebellion. Carrie Fulton. I am a policy fellow with the Climate Justice Alliance. I'm also a National Urban Fellow. So we're really happy here at the Climate Justice Youth Summit. Uh, this is the seventh one. It's very exciting to be here because you're looking at young people from all over the country and even really the world that are gathering together to discuss climate justice and what that means and how we're all directly impacted and connected. You know what? Let's do a quick chat. Y'all ready for a chat? I can't hear y'all. Y'all ready for a chant? So my name is Naisha Mallet. I'm a climate justice youth organizer at Uprose Brooklyn, woo. Um, so today is the Climate Justice Youth Summit, which is something that we've been doing over the past 10 years. Um, it's usually the largest gathering of young people of color to come t learn and talk about climate change and climate justice and what a just transition looks like and what solutions we want to put forth um, to solve the problem. This year, we're doing it in September around the Climate Week. It's the two year anniversary of Maria. And we we also know that yesterday was a whole bunch of climate strikes that was happening up in New York and across the world and this is our frontline climate strike, frontline leadership from the youth and across the world. Hi, my name is Chelsea. I'm an artist and youth organizer with Uprose. How I'm connected to the summit is that I was the artist um, behind all the art and I also was one of the lead organizers at the summit. In any movement, the things could feel really heavy. And I feel like art really helps people, um, people's hearts to get connected. Because if your heart's not in it, you're not going to stay in it. I just cannot help but tell you that the future is bright. Because you are all invested, like so many generations before you, to fight for justice. When we saw four million people around the world Young people missing class, missing lessons in the classroom because they were about to teach us a lesson that what it takes is leadership and courage. It is up to you because as many of you have said, there is not planet B and we are all in this together. Talk about the way that we tell this history, Libro, because I'm thinking to myself, you know, you two are great, and I'm reminded of the movements that I was part of in my teens, which were saying some of the same things about nuclear conflagration. I went and camped out at the Greenham Common Women's Air Force, you know, women's encampment protesting U.S. Air Force um, missile, cruise missiles, and we felt that same sense of urgency. And the story that is told of the 80s is, well, that was just a kind of, you know, explosion of activism.
But it also led to a non-proliferation treaty. The cruise missiles had to be removed. You saw a, a difference in the a nuclear discussion because of people, especially women and young people, speaking from our hearts. Um, and yet you, but it goes back to the story because the story is told that this stuff maybe worked once in the civil rights movement. Sure. But it's not true, it has worked. It does work and I think the challenge for any movement is how do you zero in on a strategy to get to these bold demands? Right. I mean, these four demands that were laid out are huge, they're massive. The, the thing that prevents us from getting there is the lack of power. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, nonviolent direct action, civil disobedience, these are tactics. They have to be deployed in a power building strategy. Mm -hmm. How do we? Meaning? Meaning we have to grow organizations, we have to grow institutions, we have to um, win some victories. People don't stay in movements where you lose all the time. Right. Um, and I think that that's one of the challenges is to use these dramatic actions as an educational uh, and media moment, but then to capture that moment, you have to build organization and build infrastructure. So give us an example of where you think that's happened, and then I'd love to hear from you how it's happening where you are. Well, I think that, you know, Examples of that is where people build local organizations. The climate strike was not just a, a, you know, a single flash in the pan event. It actually built local high school committees. It built local structures. Um, and to the extent that those continue and that they build over time and aren't about one event, then that is, shows the ability to actually win some victories. Um, we can't just also, we can't just have demands, we have to have clear targets. Mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges is like, who are we demanding this yeah. from? And how do we put pressure on those targets? Because um, that's an important principle of organizing, is we have to figure out who can give us this win, and how do we actually make it worth their while? Giovanni, do you have answers to any of those questions? The fact of the matter is that nonviolent direct action works. Erika Chenoweth, one of the leading scholars on how to bring about radical political change, says that we don't have any more excuses anymore. We know what is the most effective strategy and tool to power build and create a structural change in society, and that is nonviolent direct action. It's very, it's very straightforward. If you can get 3.5% of the population mobilized in sustained resistance, nonviolent resistance, you can bring about a radical political change in a very, very short time scale. And so this is exactly. Need, you don't need millions of people. You don't you need, need millions 3. of people. You need 3.5% of the population in question, which yeah. I guess would be a million in the US. In New York City, it's around 280,000 people. Yeah. Um, but in terms of victories, I think I am quite on board with uh, Libero um, because um, at our last movement, we got the New York City, uh, the city government to declare a climate emergency. Um, I've had the privilege of organizing with the strikers. Uh, I was one of the 15 students in New York City who led 315,000 people out of school and onto their street, onto the street. and. Absolutely, the movement um, required a coalition. It required seeds in every school in New York City. We provided the students with resources and then we let them do with those resources what they would. And they created affinity groups. They created a community. I mean, XR uh, prides itself in its community building yeah. orientation. Um, we have the youth and then we have uh, uh, groups of neighborhood groups. We have Flatbush group, we have a uh, um, upper North Manhattan group, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the reason why XR would say that our movement is working is because it's not one arbitrary action. It's day after day after day. One group of, co one cohort of people gets arrested, another comes in and takes their place. Which again is another media myth that it's just the action in the street or that the action in the street is not connected to the organizing, even by virtue of a person yeah. who's doing both. This question of how do we keep moving and what are you know, useful targets, I'm very interested in one of the more visible um, civil disobedience 
direct action, nonviolent movements that we've seen in this country in the last few years was the Standing Rock protest yes. around Dapple, the um, pipeline. There, a focus on sovereignty and tribal rights is intimately connected to this struggle because, well, for lots of strategic reasons. Do you want to talk about where that stands? Sure. I mean, I think Standing Rock was a powerful moment. It, it was seen around the world as a peaceful act of, of civil disobedience. This prayer camp in uh, North Dakota and on the Standing Rock or near the Standing Rock uh, Sioux Tribe Reservation. And even though that immediate demand around stopping the pipeline was lost, it spurred on movements all over the country. It created one of the biggest uh, uh, sort of resurgences in tribal sovereignty movements, local organizing around the country. And one of the ways they did that is there was training that happened at Standing Rock. There was political education. There was uh, uh, community building and networking that happened. That kind of movement infrastructure is needed whether you win or lose a particular struggle. It lays the basis for bigger struggles ahead. So the Keystone XL pipeline fight, which is now back on in, in South Dakota and elsewhere, um, the seeds of that resistance came out of Standing Rock. And I think, you know, strat good strategies aren't just about how to win. They're also like, well, how do you lose? Yeah. And how do you respond to a loss uh, and come out stronger? And how do you not lose a tool that could be critically important in protecting some land from exploitation, namely sovereignty rights. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that, you know, tribal uh, uh, sovereignty in the United States and, uh, and this question of indigenous people's rights um, is a powerful weapon because indigenous people are both at the forefront of the crisis and they're at the forefront of protecting Mother Earth. Yeah. Um, so it's a, a, an important a lesson, I think, for all of us is to support those indigenous struggles. So do you have questions for these two? Do you have questions for him? According, and I, I just want to build on it too, is that, you know, indigenous peoples are 5% of the world population, but protect more than 80% of its biodiversity. So if we want to talk about, you know, protecting the biodiversity of this planet, this ecological catastrophe that we're in, we have to talk about protecting indigenous people's rights. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line at the end of the day. Also, I'd like to add that the disenfranchised communities, the people who face the effects of the climate crisis are the people that are least um, affiliated with causing it. Um, I live in Coney Island at the moment. Um, my family faced the effects of Hurricane Sandy very dramatically. Our house flooded to the second floor. Nine years later, our small island is still upturned. The streets are not paved. We don't have trash cans. There is a climate sort of injustice going on amongst black and brown communities that is not talked about. Why is there a Whole Food every single block in New York City when we don't have access to uh, sufficient grocery in these areas? It's it is. It goes down to the nitty gritty. It's the quality of life. It's the uh, the. If you can't feed yourself, if you can't feed your children, how do you expect them to go to college to have a future? It's everything. At the very end, ties back to this injustice, this exploitation. It's um, we have the money to buy the resources, so we're going to buy them. We're going to take all of them, and we're going to let the other people starve mm -hmm. because they couldn't afford them, and it's too bad. We often end this program by asking people what they think the story will be that the future tells of now. Which one of you wants to go first on that? What do you think is the story that the future will tell about us in this moment? Libra? You know, young people often lead the way on radical social change. And I think about these kids, really, in, in Birmingham, Alabama, who by the thousands went into segregated jails in order to, to end segregation and end Jim Crow. Um, I think we're going to look back at some point at the young people leading these climate movements as those, those kind of kids who change the world. 
Um, my personal heroes are the students in the Greensboro sit-ins. Um, the way they organized, the way they worked together, the way that their resistance is looked back at today. I don't know what the future holds. I'm not going to be very optimistic, neither am I going to be pessimistic, because it, for me, it's a very thing, it's, a, it's the thing in question. I'm not fighting for my freedom, I'm fighting for my future. And therefore, um, there's going to be a sort of, why didn't you do anything? Coming from my generation, coming from people younger than me, um, it's going to be 30 years ago, scientists declared that we are in a climate emergency. 30 years ago. Why didn't you do anything then? Um, it shouldn't be a learning moment. It should be, in order to even think about the future, we have to protect it now. So I, I don't know where I stand in terms of that. Giovanni? The very survival of the species, the human species, hangs in the balance. If we don't do anything right now to stop this crisis, there will be no history. Giovanni, Aisha, Libro, thank you so much for coming on the program and sounding the alarm. It better get heard. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show. We'll keep doing our part. Thanks. With your help. <laughs>